Well, you can tell, if you're a visitor, you can tell um, that my Canadian accent is slightly different than your Canadian accent. <laughs> and where I come from, I don't have an accent, you have the accent. <laughs> but now I have the accent and people say to me, where's that accent from? And I say, White Rock. But we've been here like 26 years now, and you can tell because my accent's almost gone, right? Yeah, right. If you need translating, Ed, Pastor Ed will help you. Um, normally, we have subtitles when I preach, but for now, you just have to do the best you can. One of the things I love about Canada is that we recycle everything. And we have our boxes, and blue one, and the red one, and the yellow one, and the green one, and we dutifully put our recycling stuff in and Canadians are passionate about recycling and we hate pollution especially the the plastics that pollute the ocean so each week we dutifully sort our garbage and go through it we look like the people in the rubbish dump at Manila and we go through the garbage and and we sort it into the plastic recycling uh, bins even when you go out in public there are places where you can put your recycling in. Now, here's an interesting statistic. According to the Recycling Council of Ontario, I looked up their website the other day, and uh, after 30 years of recycling, this is from their website. Canada recycles just 9% of its plastics, with the rest dumped in landfilled, uh, landfill and incinerators or tossed away as litter. So 9% of what you sort gets recycled and the rest goes in the trash. At one point, Australia did this as well, we imported our trash overseas to poorer countries and they just burned it and incinerated it. All the plastics going into the... Well, that's a bit of a downturn. We're actually polluting the oceans and all that stuff with plastics like never before. <laughs> Now, that may be a, a shocking revelation to you, but could I suggest that there is a more important issue about recycling that most of us very seldom consider? Have you ever considered the pollution of your own soul? We're so concerned about the environment that we forget about our own souls. Do you have plastic clogging up your soul? Because that's what Paul the apostle who wrote this passage to uh, James, the apostle who wrote this passage, is actually teaching us. So, I've entitled my sermon today "Worldly Pollution." I want to explore that a little bit with us today. Worldly pollution. Let's see what the text says. Now, if you've got a pencil and paper, I want you to write down these four sentences I'm going to tell you because I want you to learn them. I don't want this to be theory. Otherwise, you'll see what James says. At the end of the reading, James says, I want you to stop yourself from being polluted by the world. Well, how do you do that? So I want you to consider this stuff. This is serious. He says, this is James. So this is, for those of you who don't know, this is James, the brother of John. James and John, sons of thunder, sons of Boanerges. John, the brother, wrote the Gospel of John and he wrote the book of Revelation. James, his half-brother, his brother, wrote this epistle, James. And we read in the book of Acts that Herod had James spear, um, run through with a sword. He was martyred. So James says, dear brothers and sisters, so that means he's writing to the church. Dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. That's why you're writing this stuff down. You're supposed to take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to anger. Now, guess what? In the Greek, everyone means everyone. Whether you're a Christian or not, here's a really good piece of advice. You should be slow to speak slow uh, quick to listen slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger doesn't produce the righteousness that God desires if you keep getting angry all the time 
you won't be able to live a life that God wants you to live. So brothers and sisters, that's you, and everybody, that's the whole world, here's a lesson we can learn. God wants you to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to angry, to, to get angry. This is some of the best advice we could ever give. Listen carefully. Don't talk too much. And don't get angry at things. It's not exactly the message of the world we live in. The world we live in is always blaming somebody else for the ills of the world. It's not my problem, it's somebody else. The world doesn't own its own stuff. It's easier to find faults in other people. And that's why we have a world where everyone else is being blamed except for me. So in the world, we're slow to listen, we're quick to speak and we're quick to get angry. No wonder there's so many angry people in the world. We don't take responsibility anymore. We're blaming everybody else. And here's the problem with that. That type of anger not only doesn't please God, it's hard to live a life of righteousness if you're living that type of anger. If you're quick to be angry and quick to speak and slow to listen, Human anger doesn't produce righteousness. Now, there is a godly anger. We'll talk about that for another sermon for another day. But if you're going around slamming doors, always angry, you won't be able to live a life pleasing to God. You keep losing your temper. You won't be able to live a, a, a righteous life. So here's the first thing I want you to see that God's saying to us this morning. If you're quick to listen and slow to speak, and slow to become angry, you'll be able to live a life of righteousness. You'll be able to live a life that's pleasing to God. So here's the first sentence I want you to write down. This is the instruction that we've been given today. Are you ready for this, church? Yes. God desires purity from you. Write that down. God desires purity from you a pure life quick to listen slow to speak and slow to be angry god desires purity from you purity is the first word you want to have now because he wants you to live a pure life verse 21, therefore, he says, get rid of all moral filth and evil that's so prevalent. Anybody agree with that statement? That moral filth and evil is prevalent in our culture today. We've been so baptised by moral filth and evil that we don't even know what it is anymore. We, we, we become so desensitised to moral filth and evil that we're supposed to get rid of, we don't know what that is because James says you get rid of that and humbly accept the word that was planted in you that will bring you salvation. Don't just listen to it. Do it. If God wants you to live a righteous life, a life that's pure, that's pleasing to him, and in order to do that, if you're living that life, you need to get rid of moral filth and evil. Well, I tell you, you do a survey, most people have no idea what that is. What does God think moral filth is? What does God think is evil? That's the definition we follow. Get rid of these things defined by God because it's so prevalent. The scary thing is that we don't even know what that is anymore. We don't know how to get rid of what God wants us to get rid of. And God says it's really displeasing. Let me give you some examples. Our whole perversion of sexual identity, especially in the visual media. I've been around long enough, love watching movies. A lot of the movies if it's a 90-minute movie about 
minute 59 it's built in they have a porn scene oh no that's just a love scene no that's called porn we're so familiar with that what the bible calls adultery and fornication here's something shocking did you know the bible teaches us that we shouldn't have sex before we're married what's that well that's called purity and righteousness if you're a Christian, that's how you live. Killing unborn babies, no matter which way you cut it, that's evil. The destruction of marriage and the family. Using people for what they can get. That's what, remember in the old days, you get a contractor and you would shake hands with him and the contract would be done. Now you need six lawyers on one side of the board table, six lawyers on the other side of the board table before you can even sign a contract. Not caring for our neighbours anymore. Not obeying those in authority. You know, Christians are supposed to obey the authorities around us. Unless it contravenes God's will, but we're supposed to do what we're told. We're supposed to support those in authority and the list goes on and on moral filth and evil rather than accepting the word of God that was presented to you and brought you salvation Paul um, um, James says if you humbly accept the word of God that was planted in you it'll bring you salvation it'll save you from moral filth and evil this word this is the written word. It points to the living word. And the living word, we call him Jesus, shows us how to live life. He will save you from moral filth and evil. What do you mean, save you? Well, let me tell you, we need saving from moral filth and evil. It'll destroy us. If you're a Christian here, this word will remind you that Jesus is your Lord. He's the boss. You follow the written word, it'll bring you salvation. It'll save you from all of this stuff. Now, let me explain this to you. Jesus is the written word. He's represented in the Bible. If you're messed up with moral filth and evil, he can save you. And I know all about that firsthand. Moral filth and evil were my best friends when I was a young man. And I needed saving. Those of you who know my story because I've told it, know that I was a mess. And by the age of 22, I was already a drunk. I needed saving. If you confess that stuff to him and tell him you're sorry and you dedicate your life to him, He'll bring you salvation in real life. He'll save you from moral filth and evil. And of course, if you want to talk about that further, I'm going to be around all day, so we can discuss that. I've got time to, I've got time to tell you my story. But here's the point. Instead of living like that, you and I need to start living these countercultural lives. We've got to show our neighbours by the way we live. Now, here's the warning in this. Don't just listen to these words. Go and do it. Oh, you pastor, that was a great sermon. Thank you very much. And then promptly forget what you've taught. What was the sermon last week? have no idea. I can't even remember if I went to church last week. Sunday's over. Back to normal. Just keep going on what you're doing. James says that if you're not listening and you're not doing what you hear, you're deceiving yourself. You're lying to yourself. Don't just listen to the word, do it. I got a fantastic idea. Let's get some bumper stickers called Just Do It. <laughs> That's not bad. Just do it. You see, when you do what you've listened to, it proves you have integrity. 
Now, I know that's not a big quality that we're looking for in people today, but I want to suggest to you that integrity is one of the most precious gifts of God and characteristics of God that you can own, personal integrity. So here's the second thing I want to write to you. This is the reward, right? If the fir- I want you to write this down. If the th- first one was God desires purity from you, that's the instruction, then here's the reward. God offers sanctity to you. God offers sanctity to you. You live a life of purity and you will have salvation. God offers sanctity to you. Halfway there. Now, get a warning or an example. This is verse 23. Anyone who listens to the word, so I'm the preacher, you're listening, so this refers to you now. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So you're having spaghetti for dinner and there's spaghetti all over your face and you go and look in the mirror and normally you would go wipe it off. But James says, if you're a person who listens but doesn't do it, it's like you go walk into the kitchen or into the bathroom, look at all the spaghetti sauce on your face, don't wipe it off and then go walk around in public saying, how are you? (laughs) Bit of spaghetti hanging down here, sauce on your nose. That's what that, that that's the analogy, that's the example of not doing it when you hear it. Here's the converse. If anyone looks intently into the perfect law, that's an example of saying if you're looking at the word of God, like the mirror of God, if you're looking at the word of God that gives you freedom and you keep doing it and don't forget what you've heard. You'll be blessed in what you do. Let me tell you what blessed means. Blessed means that you will find God's favour and God will help you survive life in an abundant way. You'll no longer have just a survival kit. You'll have a battle plan for life. It's not just hanging on surviving. It'll be life and abundant life, quality of life. If you can look into that mirror of the Word of God, listen to it and do it. So here's the third thing I want you to write down. This is the challenge now. God expects integrity in you. God expects integrity in you God desires purity from you he offers sanctity to you and he inspect expects integrity in you last point if you go to church and you call yourself a Christian you may want to close your ears now because this is pretty rough here the next bit Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceives themselves and their religion is worthless. But the religion that God wants, God the Father, the religion that he sees as pure and faultless is this, looking after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep yourself being polluted from the world. So here's a final warning. If you consider yourself a Christian, you think yourself a religious person. Now quickly, let's make sure the word religion means something different today than it was back then. The Greek word threskos actually means someone who's devoted to their faith a proper expression of religious belief, someone who's devout, someone who's pious, someone who's religious, someone who's living a godly life. To live as God would have a person live. 
to live like one should who believes in God. That's a religious life. Always doing, trying to do what God requires of you. If you consider yourself a religious person, then you need to keep a tight rein on your tongue. Now, if you're a professional speaker, that is a real challenge. Keep a tight rein on your tongue. If you don't, you're deceiving yourself and your religion is worthless. Now, I'm not going to do a survey right now, but how many of you, don't put your hand up for this, how many of you have been hurt by religious people? And how many have you been turned off the church because of religious people? So the question is, why the tongue? Like, if you're a religious person, why should you, like, rein in your tongue? Why not just be a nice person, love everybody? Well, James goes on later on in chapters 3 and um, following to talk about the tongue. You've probably heard this. The tongue is a small part of the body. But it makes a great boast. Consider how a fire, a forest fire, is started by a spark. The tongue is also a fire and it corrupts the whole body, sets a whole person's course of life on fire and itself is set on fire by hell. The tongue is a really dangerous thing. This is what he writes, James writes later on. No human being can tame the tongue. It's restless, it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise the Lord and Father of heaven and with it we curse human beings who are made in God's likeness. In other words, if you want to prove authenticity in your faith, You need to control your tongue. Quick to listen. Slow to speak, slow to anger. Your tongue proves the authenticity of your faith rather than a loose tongue. So if that's the sort of religion that God doesn't want, the loose tongue, what's the sort of religion that he does want? Well, you see that in verse 27. The religion that God the Father accepts, the religion that God the Father considers as pure and faultless, go to church every Sunday, give lots of money and say your prayers. Nope, doesn't say that. Walk around really sanctimonious, holier than thou. Nope, doesn't say that. Go and love your neighbours. No, it doesn't even say that. This is what James writes. If you want a religion in pure definition that's pure and faultless, care for people who are in need. And he quotes here, widows and orphans who are in distress. Could be anybody in distress. Why widows and orphans? Why does he? Well, people who can't pay you back. People who can't reward you for what you've done. People who are neglected by society. People who are lost in the social network. Care for those people. That's what, that's what James says. Pure and faultless religion. You're caring for people that can't pay you back. We do that all the time in our culture. In Australia, I worked in youth work and I was the execu- executive director of Youth for Christ... And I used to go to meetings in jeans and a T-shirt and um, people would just let me sit wherever I want. Then I'd go at another time and put my suit and tie on, Youth for Christ. I'd go to sit at the head of the table. People say, what do you do? I'm just a youth worker. Oh, you go sit over there. What do you do? I'm the executive director of Youth for Christ in Western Australia. Oh, well, could you come and That's not right. Like... We should be caring for orphans and widows. And 
let me say to you, if you're a widow here in our community, um, and we even have some orphans amongst us, you know as a widow I've phoned you regularly and made sure that you were looked after. Because that's what we're supposed to do. Here's the other thing that God says is religion that's pure and faultless. It's people who keep themselves from being polluted by the world. Worldly pollution. People who keep themselves from being polluted by the world. Do you actually have a strategy of how to keep yourself being polluted from the world? I mean, do you have any screen? What do you watch on TV? What do you watch on social networks? I tell you, the social network stuff, talking about speaking quickly and losing anger. Do you have any controls that you've set, any disciplines in your life to stop you from being polluted by the world? Or is your soul clogged up with lots of plastics, spiritual plastics? If you're living an authentic Christian life, you're going to watch this, less of this and more of this, and you're going to watch how you get polluted in your soul. You're going to look after your soul. Some people don't even believe that we have a soul. That's cool. After you die, you'll find out. But up until then, they don't have an idea. And you might want to consider that. So here's the final warning. Here's the fourth statement for you. God requires authenticity by you. God requires authenticity by you. So let me finish with this. The challenge for you and for me is to live an authentic Christian life. To keep ourselves from being polluted from the world and by the world. So four key words. The instruction was God desires purity from you. The reward that God offers sanctity to you. You bring your life and salvation. The challenge is God expects integrity in you. And fourthly, the warning, God requires authenticity by you. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear these words. May we live them and follow them. In Jesus' name, amen.